Welcome back to part two of our feature on the AMX 13. In part one, we talked about one of the many radical aspects of its design, the autoloader. So I think it's time we took a closer look at how it works. Here below me in the bustle is the autoloader. On each side is a hatch for loading shells into the magazines. Let me explain how it works. There are two cylindrical magazines, each holding six rounds. As the gun fires, the recoil extracts the spent shell case, which is ejected through the rear flap. Using a hand wheel, the gunner then rotates one magazine, dropping a fresh round into the loading tray. As this is rammed onto the breech, the breech block is released and closes. The gun is now ready to fire. This meant that the AMX could fire off up to 12 rounds very quickly. But after that, there was a problem, since the magazines could only be loaded from outside the vehicle. So the tank had to withdraw to somewhere safer to do this. To cope with this interruption, AMXs usually operated in pairs, allowing one to cover while the other reloaded. Tanks are rarely very spacious, but the AMX is particularly tight. The three crew members are separated from one another. The commander and the gunner cannot even see each other as they are separated by the gun. Right in front of the gunner is the key control for the gun. It's a bit like an Xbox controller. Rotating it side to side traverses the turret. Rotating it up and down elevates the gun. Firing of both the main gun and the machine gun is by foot pedals. Above the gun controls is the optical gun sight, and above that is the periscope. Here in the commander's position, you can see his turret controls and the hand wheel for selecting the magazine. In front, he has a tactical radio to communicate with other tanks. The main radio is down on the floor to his right. Also down there are stowage racks for more ammunition. What's it like to drive? This one, it's, uh, once you get used to it, it's good. Talk us through the driver's controls. Uh, the driver's controls, well, as you know, once you sit in the driver's position, it's actually quite compact. Right in front of you, uh, you have the instrument panel, which is in two halves. On the right-hand side, you've got the mechanical side, temperatures and pressures, speedo, etc. On the left-hand side is the electrical panel, uh, with the switches and electrical gauges. Um, sticking out of the instrument panel is the gear lever. It's one of those typical French ones. It's a push-pull, in-out, turn left and right. And then to the right of the instrument panel, you've got a hand throttle. Um, set the throttle if necessary. Uh, moving down to the floor, you've got the normal three pedals, accelerator, brake and clutch, as you'll find in a car. And then moving back towards the driver, you'll have the four levers. Uh, the outer levers are for the brakes and the hubs on the outside here, and the inner levers control the differential brakes. The reason why it's got the four levers, again, at the time, it was quite innovative. Uh, the outer levers control the outer brakes in the hubs. The inner levers control the differential brakes. So if you're doing slow speed maneuvers, you use the outer levers. But once you're on the move, you've got finer adjustments on the uh, differentials. So from that side, it is quite nice to drive once you get used to And it is road legal, apparently. This one, yeah. It's um, fully taxed, insured, and licensed to drive it. I drive it. I do drive it on the road. You must get some strange looks then, if you. Yeah, you get a few looks. It's uh, especially at junctions when you're waiting there at traffic lights.
The engine was also quite interesting. It was a new French-built Sofan motor, based on an earlier aero engine design by another French company, Matisse. It is a horizontally opposed eight-cylinder petrol engine, producing 270 horsepower. Simply stated, it is flat, not vertical, meaning that the engine compartment and the hull height can be kept quite low. Unlike the standard layout of the day, it is mounted at the front, on the right, driving the front sprocket. Looking at the chassis, it has five road wheels with return rollers and torsion bar suspension. And with an all-up weight of around 15 tonnes, the AMX produced a top road speed of around 60 kilometres per hour and a good cross-country performance. Armour was one of the areas where a major compromise was made to keep the weight down. Effectively, the AMX is proof only against small arms of various calibres and also shell fragments, not much more. At the front, the welded hull has 40 millimetres of armour, with the same on the cast turret, but only 20 millimetres on the sides of both. The AMX entered production in 1954 and remained in production until 1964 as a gun tank. Even today, it is in service in Indonesia and Singapore. The chassis remained in production for far longer and was the basis for a whole family of other vehicles, from self-propelled guns to engineer vehicles to APCs. It was widely exported, especially to the Middle East, Israel, but also Asia and other NATO countries in Europe. It proved to be a reliable light armoured vehicle, capable of providing good support to infantry and of defending itself against most, but not all, enemy armour. For the sorts of conflicts it found itself in, it performed well and prolonged the life of the light tank to the end of the 20th century.